Ladies and gentlemen, the technologies that enhance our organizations and our lives are more powerful and more essential than ever, ever before. Forward thinking organizations, including governments, understand the technological forces that surround them and look for ways to harness them for the benefit of citizens and constituents alike. Up next is the panel discussion. We'll hear our experts discussing reimagine government technology in 2022. I would now like to invite Arpit Gupta, Assistant Editor, ET Government, to moderate the session. Dear viewers and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the panel discussion Reimagine Government Technology in 2022, part of third edition of National Governance Virtual Summit. On behalf of ET Government, I, Arpit Gupta, welcome our esteemed panelists. The Prime Minister launched the Digital India program in the year 2015 with three clear objectives. It was to leverage technology for transforming the lives of people, expanding economic opportunities, creating capabilities in certain strategic technologies. India's IT services sector, digital government initiatives, and the fast emerging tech startup ecosystem have shown resilience and maturity, not only to meet the challenges of this pandemic, but are now role models for other developing and less developed countries. The digital drive in India is in full swing to bring 100% of the population on the internet network. And the internet has become an intrinsic part of our lives and we use it to learn, communicate, and find opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, to lead the panel, I am joined by eminent leaders. I welcome Dr. Santosh Babu, Managing Director, Kerala State Information Technology Infrastructure Limited and Kerala Fiber Optic Network, KFON. I also welcome Mr. Manoj Kumar Patnaik, Additional Secretary, Electronics and Information Technology Department and CEO of Odisha Computer Application Center, OCAC, Government of Odisha. I also welcome Mr. Arvind Kumar, Director General, Software Technology Parks of India, STPI. I welcome Dr. Akhilesh Gupta, Senior Advisor, Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. I have also been joined by Mr. Prashant Kumar Mittal, MD, National Informatics Center Services, NICSI. And from the industry side, we have been joined by Mr. D.K. Das, Executive Vice President and Head Government Business, Access Bank, and Mr. Varun Gupta, Director Sales, Government and Public Sector, CLIC. I welcome all of you. Let me begin the discussion. My first question, to Dr. Santosh Babu. Sir, COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the adoption of technology. How the government of Kerala used technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, AR, VR, IoT, and cloud, and other technology-based applications to mitigate the pandemic challenge? And what is next for you in technology for transformation? Over to you. Thank you, uh, Arpit. Um, glad to be with all the participants here, all the co-panelists. The government of Kerala has always been a proactive uh, government in terms of uh, using technology for governance. And especially this pandemic came in as a, a shock to root shock to everybody, but we rose to the occasion. I just joined four months back. So, but I can tell you with confidence that the government of Kerala was uh, possibly one of the first states to use technology to reach out and find out, for example, at the last mile, how many beds are available? Are oxygen cylinders available? Um, uh, how many patients are getting vaccination? Etc. on a common platform. So they created a common platform out of Calicut uh, district, which is started off by a Calicut district collector. And subsequently it was subsumed into the state of Kerala. And uh, the use of technologies like blockchain, I'm not sure blockchain or artificial intelligence was used, but I think um, uh, the, the, the web technology was used extensively. Uh, and uh, we also have a huge uh, open source, uh, uh, you know, enthusiast group also, which has helped uh, Ernakulam district to actually zoom in on to the last mile person who is actually needing that oxygen and you know uh, in, in comparison to somebody else. So the kind of technology that has been used especially uh, during the COVID and during the uh, flood in 2018 etc has been exemplary. Um, 
we are uh, now working on the emerging technologies like blockchain and uh, artificial intelligence etc to come out with something called predictive governance uh, so we're working on it that is uh, the citizens are now thronging the offices right uh, to get the certificates and stuff like that the question that we are asking ourselves is why should any citizen apply why should they apply for these charitable certificates why can't it be delivered to their citizen vault with using the mobile phone and uh, you know that's the level of discussion that's happening right now and so there's a, a citizen registry that's happening right now um where you know all this credential management etc will be done using blockchain uh, so we are working on it so uh, that's my answer to your question thank you dr babu now let me go to uh, mr arvind kumar dgstpi with the same question sir how has been your experience how has the it industry used technologies and emerging technologies as we discuss to mitigate the pandemic challenge and what is next for you in technology for transformation over to you uh, it has been a really very a uh, bad time for all of us uh, pandemic brought a lot of disruption across all aspects of the life but the best part is uh, indian telecom industry along with government of india have left no stone unturned uh, to meet the exigency of contemporary requirement whether it is a telecom industry uh, or whether it is broadcasting industry which is uh which is very much required when you are at home uh, you can watch the channel there was no disruption in the uh, broadcasting sector as such uh, you get uh, good data speed there was no disruption in uh, data speeds so industry as well as government uh, work together uh, to meet all the requirements uh, which is ar- arose because of uh, this pandemic and uh, this whole a uh, whole model of working has changed from uh, that era to now uh, now from work uh, from home has become a norm and uh, government has supported in all the manners you see all uh, permissions all uh, licenses wherever it was possible uh, even if you go to the airport uh, there is no need of having the physical uh, boarding pass everything has been done electronically so so government has done lot of things which ensure that uh there is a no touch uh while you are handling with the government services or you are any essential services and this uh, this uh, technology has played a, a very major role uh, when it comes to education system government immediately uh, responded to it and uh, they have introduced uh, it's called swayam when it comes to medical they have immediately done uh, arogya setu sometimes it's come covin so the, you can't you can't expect from the government of india before this pandemic that their response will be so fast i mean this government has learned a lot from that that even if you are not equipped with something then pandemic come and you have to do it i mean you have to do right so this we as a we as a government officers we as a government employees now uh, are able to work like private sector that you have to respond i mean you can't wait that i am government i whatever i want to do i can do it but so this kind of the natural uh, Uh, change in the working of the government you can see and we we all by the government uh, telecom industry or any other industry they we were quite united for this and when you say uh, whether we were using artificial intelligence blockchain this artificial intelligence is not something which is zero and one you are not using artificial intelligence or you are using artificial intelligence you are using artificial intelligence the the, the day internet came in in this world so maybe some sort of when you are searching uh when you are searching some uh, air- airlines about the some travel from one place to another you can see from maybe last uh, uh, 10 years back that you will get once you searched for one flight from delhi to chennai uh, you will get lot of choices from delhi to chennai in here every year. this is also artificial intelligence yes now when we were reading the artificial intelligence handicap was that we we were not having that data so that we can have a good sort of artificial intelligence products so we were sort of the data technology was already there now the best part is we are having lot of data whether it has been supported by uh, your upi whether it is supported by coven whether it is supported by uh, uh, nic whether it is supported by uh, number of transactions now happening so this is all this is all helping us to collect the data and the the you will have as better as 
you know, possible artificial intelligence as much just data you have and as much as data you are sharing i may be having data of uh, uh, one thing somebody may be having the data of another thing but this collaboration of this data now start happening among the private uh, service provider i think this should be done through by the government also because government is the biggest uh, keeper of the data in this country and therefore once this data sharing transparently happens i think uh, uh, artificially artificial intelligence can be used in a in a very big manner as far as the uh, blockchain technology is concerned uh, though blockchain technology appears to be a uh, new but somewhere one way or other way it was already there in the our uh, in, in our uh, technology part now and this blockchain technology could be very useful for this country when it comes to uh, transaction it can create a digital ledger system we have implemented then i was in uh, but uh, telecom regulatory authority of india for this uh, unsolicited commonly uh, commercial communication we have implemented uh, two years back which is called digital ledger system dlt type of the system so this technology is not zero one type it is always progressive in nature it happens in bits and pieces and that is what is happening with uh, artificial intelligence this is what is happening with the uh, uh, blockchain technology in this country so let me go to mr manoj kumar patnaik asking uh, this question sir how has the government of odisha used uh, technologies and emerging technologies to mitigate the pandemic challenges and what is next for you in technology for transformation what is latest on internet for all mission over to you as you must be uh, aware we have extensively used uh, technology in dealing and tackling uh, covid so we have first partnership with many tech firms like tech firms and organizations like deloitte iids and uh, many other um, uh, institutions of uh, prominence to uh, bring us solution to handle the uh, covid whether it is uh, contact tracing or finding the movement of unauthorized moving in restricted areas and uh, the uh, the location of uh, uh, the uh, covid in, uh, covid uh, treatment infrastructure we used ivr based uh, 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 call, call center for uh, uh, for to, uh, in, to, to remain in touch with covid patients our state of the art covid dashboard powered by big data analytics predictive analytics and visualization strengthen our pandemic response management use mobile based location to contain uh, to 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 track uh, movement in unauthorized movement in containment zones we used interactive bots on uh, whatsapp help in dissemination of quick and easy information we are uh, so this way we uh, we uh, manage uh, uh, we manage and contain and control covid and i think uh, you also will agree that odisha is one of the foreigners in containing the uh, covid uh, to a very commendable extent and what about connectivity uh, sir has already said uh, uh, arvin sir has already sir said about connectivity so uh, or till we reach uh, broad to you take broadband till uh, villages people will not get the services that we are doing at the uh, at the central level whatever uh, whatever uh, uh, technology use unless it flows till the villages because india lives in villages so so the, our first work was to reduce the digital the digital divide in terms of digital digital infrastructure and digital knowledge so in digital information digital uh, uh, infrastructure first is connectivity still odisha has 7000 villages having no uh, uh, mobile coverage now now odisha government is uh, requesting the government of india to first cover all the all the villages under mobile coverage our bharat net has as bharat net has taken broadband to all the gram panchayats now our next target is taking broadband to the village level thank you for uh, highlighting these initiatives of uh, odisha government now the same question to md nixi sir how has uh, nixi used technologies and emerging technologies other technology based applications to mitigate the pandemic challenges and what is next for you in technology for transformation yeah um, from on 22nd march 2020 we got the news that government would be implementing the lockdown and uh, the order mentioned that uh, services like nic 
uh, would be essential service and uh, they will be allowed to move around but the problem was manifold we were not having vehicles to commute we were not having pass but with the help of all the stakeholders uh, sdm gurgaon sdm noida we could arrange the lifting of laptop from their um, godowns and we could get the government running because e office uh, was the application which continued government to perform and pfms is was the agency which was doing all the government transaction without any problem it was helped a lot by our partners like stpi uh, the um, uh, communication channel provider uh, banks those those all were the part of those things and we could show that uh, the things are doable things are doable and we could do uh, everything which was asked by government and uh, we um, continued our vc setup from right from the apex office through the office of district collector because all the instructions were passed through vc first and um, after uh, announcement of lockdown i personally visited all the data centers in delhi and first thing i did i took uh, my um, hygiene staff into confidence because those were the most critical uh, part of any government establishment and they are unsung heroes you should uh, you should think if they were not successful in keeping hygiene good and something happened in uh, data center uh, what turmoil it could have caused so they did uh, they helped us 24 cross 7 we arranged everything for them data center itself and uh, things passed and without any uh, much of problem but uh, we lost uh, more than 25 good officers from our organization across india and that was a severe jolt and uh, we are still not recovered from that jolt yeah your question was centric to ai ml and technologies which are um, which are being talked about these days as a responsible government um, one can't publish those things or can't tell those things uh, in open forums as it is easier for other things or technology people because whenever something is said on government platform it is it it, it is taken as truth and i think in the situation of these ai ml outputs are not so mature that government can thumpingly announce those things so we are working uh, with the help of our center of excellence in data analytics we are helping Um, many offices right from the apex office and we have come up with one uh, single window system for all the dashboards prayas and uh, the, the similar thing we are proposing to states where ai part can tell uh, how the things will move with uh, how one scheme is doing and another scheme is not able to do what is the correlation between those th- those things so we are building a statistical model and it will take some time to get mature yeah cloud is very important thing as i was on date and in today's and deliberations our additional secretary and chairperson also pointed out that we have to graduate from 500 megawatt capacity of data center as on date to 2500 uh, megawatt capacity of data center within 5 years and this is not the demand deficit uh issue now it is a delivery uh, deficit issue demand is immense so we are working in nixi we are working and we are soon coming up uh three uh, new um, partner engagement program there we shall be um, building that uh, synergy that is thank you uh, now uh, let me go to dr akhilesh gupta senior advisor dst uh so the same question to you how has the dst used technologies and emerging technologies to mitigate the pandemic challenge and what is next for you in technology for transformation well i think 
uh, I would put it like this, that COVID, in fact, uh, became a kind of enabler uh, for many new technology development. And it became also a enabler for the long-awaited and much talked about convergence of industry, academia, and government. And this is an example that we brought in in terms of when uh, you see a few years back, India was not manufacturing ventilators, kikis, diagnostic kits, and all. You know, they were all imported. And with COVID challenge, within few months, the uh, India not only started manufacturing these things, but also started importing, uh, exporting. So this is uh, the kind of difference that has come because of these the uh, kind of convergence and the uh, the connect with uh, uh, among the three verticals of you know society here in India. In fact, because of this connect, how DST has in fact taken it forward. In fact, we launched several uh, initiatives. One initiative that actually brought. Uh, uh, you know, this kind of convergence very well was an initiative called Kavach, Center for Augmenting War with COVID-19 Health Crisis. This, under this Kavach program, we supported 75 startups. Uh, and they, uh, the focus was that they should be able to uh, produce, uh, you know, market-ready products. And through these Kavach centers, centers all over the country, a lot many products came out. Many of them are like, you know, you find that uh, like PPE and mask that came up, came up because of this. The question was that, you know, how, how about the uh, technology like AI, ML, blockchain, AR, VR, and IoT, etc. have been, uh, you know, uh, kind of supported by DST and how they have performed. So in fact, DST under the there is a national mission on uh, cyber physical system launched by government in 2019. Under this mission, we have set up something like 25 technology innovation hubs, and uh, under in some of these hubs are working uh, for COVID related uh, technology. Uh, we'll give you one or two examples, like for example, the IIT Bombay, we have a hub, and similarly IIT Jodhpur, we have a technology innovation hub on AR and VR. They put together, in fact, uh, develop a tapestry method of screening uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, under the uh, program called Rakshak, or called Remedial Action Knowledge Screening and Holistic Analysis of COVID. And this has, in fact, created a lot of, in fact, this, 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 not, this kind of technology has uh, gone to the market also. Similarly, we, uh, the ISC Bangalore, there is a hub uh, which has developed AI-driven platform called Art Park. And the, this is actually, uh, you know, helping uh, the X-ray, chest X-ray interpretation, you know, during COVID, you know, the lung infection is a dominant thing, and uh, that, you know, the chest X-ray interpretation of images uh, at some uh, different location sent on WhatsApp to the doctors, and they interpret, and then they uh, give back their um, advice. Uh, this was another development that, that and the entire technology AI driven. Similarly, there's a, another technology that has been developed. Uh, by our IIT Roker uh, hub, you know, it's called MV Tag, where, you know, this is a kind of first of its kind internet of thing device that monitors MV and temperature during the transportation of vaccine. You know, vaccines are very temperature sensitive, some of them, and they need a particular temperature range. And if it exceeds that temperature, then the vaccine becomes inactive and they, they may they will damage on. So this development MV tag is attached to the, the boxes or the, the, you know uh, the carriage where you know the vaccines are being transported. 
So these are some of the themes that you know. I mean, there are many, but I have just shot uh, showed you know one or two themes. So I think I would say put it that you know uh, uh, the uh, while COVID has given a lot of challenge in terms of health and other issues, uh, uh, and the the entire working uh, has changed. COVID right. has brought a very major transformation, transformation, and and the transition from how we work, uh, you know, in in the businesses. But in government, I think we still better, and we uh, technology development have emerged very prominently through this, uh, you know, intervention that government has brought. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, now let me go to Mr. B K Das, uh, Executive Vice President and Head Government Business Access Bank. Mr. Das, as everybody talked about the adoption of technology and uh, implementation of various uh, tech-driven projects, initiatives uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic outbreak, what challenges and opportunities do you see for the banking sector? And one of the things I wanted to tell very clearly is uh, an add-on to my the panelist who was just before me who said uh, things about the government perspective, and is absolutely right. I mean, if you look from the time when the pandemic started, and I particularly looked while I'm working with the government from middle-level bureaucracy to top-level bureaucracy, I've not seen a single day been taken off from the physical side of the office. So kudos to them. Great work done by the government uh, bureaucrats and the machinery in keeping the entire chain of thoughts and entire chain processes going. So in the wake of the global pandemic, the banking industry has gone through tremendous digital changes. So financial institutions, uh, you know, are rapidly adjusting currently now to serve digitally and securely. One of the things that has very clearly happened is infusion of the of that part of the thought called the digital into each and every every one of us. There's an increasing growing digital adoption. There's a maturing of the customer expectation, and there's improved financial awareness. So what has in that case what has fundamentally worked out is that the two critical pillars of the Economy, which we talk about, is the banking and the payment cycle, are are where perhaps two of the core areas, with the major uptick in the digital offerings and the adoptions happen. So, if you look at in each and every aspect of uh, governance, be it DBT, be it data analytics, be it big data, be it enhancing exports, the Indian banking sector was always a part and parcel of this entire process. So in that case, also what has happened is how this increasing uh, engagement, the banking sector has also started facing challenges. So if you look at the first part of it, disruption, disruption created an opportunity. The entire back end of the banking system had to be ramped up properly today. And from the customer side, everybody was forced down to use digital. Today, I mean, if you look at yourself, ask yourself this fundamental question, when was the last time you went to the bank? You would have obviously been doing all your banking through either your phone or through your UPIs or through various digital platforms which you currently have. But that has also brought an increased competition. The threat that the banks today face from fintechs who basically target the most profit profitable part of the financial services, that is something which we, we have to enhance and get ourselves prepared. There's a cultural shift. The banks and the financial institutes need to promote a culture of innovation in which technology, you know, I mean, fundamentally, the technology has to be leveraged to optimize the existing processes. The business models are changing. The pandemic-led digital disruption has also brought in those changes in those business models. Customer retention is a very key part of the business currently now. So how does the customer get retained? You, get, you retain the customer by putting in various amount of ease of use platforms. And that is the only way you can retain customers currently now. And as the pandemic dies down, there is, there is, there is now footfall, which has physically started increasing. So combination of both of them is what is going to take it forward. Security breaches, obviously over a period of time, as more and more we go towards digital part of it, security breaches have also started happening. So how you work towards plug holing those security breach, breaches are also important. And there has to be Continuous set of innovations. Continuous set of innovation, when I mean it requires insight, it needs agility, it needs very rich sort of client relationship and continuous innovation. And innovation stems from insight. There's no two ways about it. 
So that's that's the challenges which we face. The opportunities are also now manifold. Opportunities now which have come in, it has given given you advanced self service capabilities. I would say, I mean the KYC compliance and everything now is all online, and the, you know I mean. So the uh, so various APIs have come in place today. If I work with the government side of it, what are the third-party softwares which we which I can dovetail into my main platform and bring benefit to the government government in terms of what are the solutions I am providing on the banking side of it? At the end of the day, I am a bank. At the end of the day, I will always be insisting on the flows to come through me. That's where I make my money. But how do I get that money It's through the various modes of operation in terms of bringing in the richness? To APIs and everything which will be there, lot of work on cloud computing, lot of opportunity on the biometric technology, big data, Internet of Things. Today, if you look at um, uh, national highway, for example, NHAI. I mean, uh, the key bankers today continue to talk to NHAI. The other day, I was talking to the chairperson of NHAI, and uh, we were very clearly told that look at how we can. You know, optimize the data that the National Highway Authority has. What what you can do to me as a solution. So these are the sort of things. So there is this very fudgy line, which is now developing between banking in the government space and IT services. And finally, I see over a period of time, a merging will also happen, and that will also happen through cognitive analytics also. So those are some of the things. The, if you look at opportunities, which has fundamentally come in, the strengths are there. The You know the challenges, the opportunities, and everything now are all falling in place. Thank you, Mr. Das. And before we conclude the first round of uh, question and answer session, let me go to Mr. Varun Gupta. Uh, Varun, uh, all the panelists uh, talked one thing in common: that is, a lot of uh, huge amount of data is being generated uh, with this technology adoption, and maintaining this data and uh, actually making this data uh, valuable. there are a lot of uh, technology to be used how is click helping the governments making data and analytics real time ai driven collaborative and actionable how important is data in policy implementation and decision making thanks uh, arpit and uh, uh, and all the panelists for sharing their views uh, yes data is uh, uh, as many of my fellow panelists from government will acknowledge and have already highlighted that data is very critical for effective decision making and for police and uh, for future policy making as, uh, uh, as well and click uh, has been working with government for a while now you know uh, more than 10 years in india and 30 years uh, across the globe different government bodies to make data accessible for effective decision making so before i uh, uh, tell uh, what click is doing and you know technology wise i i understand i represent uh, technology uh, Uh, i would say segment which is bi so speaking for bi and uh, not just for click what modern business analytics solutions are uh, bringing uh, are solving the problems of government in uh, data and few of the problems that we uh, see uh, uh, government organizations facing regularly uh, when it comes to data is data is not very uh, uh, not present in one place it's segment it's fragmented it's stored in different formats different storage options are uh, uh, they use uh, mithal sir spoke about uh, seda so we are we work with ceda also and uh, we record, they also uh, echo our uh, observations the data is not very uh, something which is readily accessible not in a format which is usable data is being used and generated by uh, a lot of business processes which are still legacy in nature i would say like printing paper and signing and then scanning the sheets and keeping it so a lot of information is uh, uh, available in a format which is not usable and that's where uh, uh, you know click comes in and modern bi tools uh, if i can represent the industry you know is helping uh, uh, organizations to convert uh, first bring that information together in one place uh, through uh, cdc tools uh, with us they were talking about bringing that data and connecting the data sources together through some way so we uh, uh, industry has uh, solutions uh, to bring data together in a real time basis together and then uh, we have solutions in artificial intelligent and ml to transform that data from different formats diverse formats unstructured audio visual nhai uh, i just heard uh, uh, someone bringing that example where in nhai also is uh, 
doing uh, collecting a lot of videos and images and there's a lot of information there but that needs to be available in a machine uh, let's say readable format so technology is helping to pass that information bringing it to a format where you know you can uh, use uh, bi and uh, analytics engine to present the information in a visual format so first part is visual format because uh, we always believe a picture is worth a thousand words a lot of graphical information information in uh, trends and things can help uh, to uh, give insights which can help to improve the service delivery which is the major part of the government's business and uh, like uh, mr babu dr babu was mentioning last mile uh, service delivery and the availability of data to the right stakeholders is critical in that uh, 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 in that direction and that's where all these uh, uh, our analytics industry uh, is working towards and has already achieved and in addition what we believe is that bringing data bringing analytics is fine but it should be easy for use, people to use many of our government officers uh, uh, will uh, find it and like most not just government officers anybody who is overwhelmed with technology you know to navigate through yet another tool uh, is difficult so uh, ai ml is making it easy to do use google like search language you know you can ask data we are working with a project with indian oil where in uh, uh its bi tools are integrated with alexa so you can simply ask rather than having to navigate through menus you can ask questions like how much has been my uh, policy implementation how has been the rainfall in this catchment area or whatever be the question and which data can answer and the tool can answer it and also it helps people to stay on top of it uh, your actions through effective alerts so if uh if the intelligence you don't have time to sit and you know go to the intelligence right like we are people are sitting in this room right but still i would want to know what's happening in my let's say focus area then in case there is an alert that i need to be monitoring then it will come to me through whatsapp sms even through email things so it helps people to take effective decision in a real time manner in a more collaborative manner so that uh, these challenges of different data related issues can be mitigated so i say uh, click in uh, particular and industry in general is already gearing up for uh, addressing these challenges uh, dr santosh babu i'll come to you with the next question what challenges do you see in the next era of digital india and smart governance and taking it to the last mile and i would also request you to please share the way forward to digitally empower india and to make it more resilient competitive and future ready um see i'll, uh, I'll explain what kerala is doing right now so um see there are only two or three things that government does one is uh, create policies second is uh, based on the policies push those files which you call as red tape and that happens in government and third is because of the pushing of those files some services reach citizens now this is what is uh, generally happening in government uh, but we'd like to you know change all that transform all that and make it world class so what we are saying is that um Uh, two objectives or three objectives we should uh, uh, have one is if a citizen is paying you taxes and government servants are like me are supposed to serve them then why should they ever visit a government office so this, this is a stand the government of kerala is taking that no citizen should ever be asked to visit a government office because you know we all live for some 27000 days and a lot of this time around 5 to 6000 days we are spending running around government offices when you go there you are not received well when you uh, ask for paper, uh, things they are not given you are asked to come back pass as pc all these kinds of things happen so question is in a democratic country like india why can't we become something like an estonia why can't we have services across the board to be done on the mobile phone so first question is why should a citizen ever visit a government office second is if we know that the citizens exist then why should he ever apply so this is another thought process there is the point is we know that this is an excess you know if, if a man is born or a woman is born we give a birth certificate and we know that if we are born we also go on to die so we give a death certificate in way, even after death there is something called a legal heir certificate so from birth to death and even beyond government is there and during the lifetime of a citizen large number of certificates are issued and for all these people have to throng these government offices we want to put an end to this so one thing what that's happening in kerala right now is by august 15 um uh, by uh, may june i should be able to connect around 30000 government offices by kerala fiber optic network around 35000 kilometers we are laying as of now we are on the you know um home stretch right now trying to finish all this 
connectivity, 35,000 kilometers uh, we are putting on the KCB, Kerala State Electricity Board lines, reaching up to the 30,000 government offices. And then we are connecting also the around 20 lakh homes uh, through uh, the K4 network. Now, so the idea here is, while I give this connection, all these government, 30,000 government offices are getting installed with e-office of NIC. Already all the government offices in, let's say, Trivandrum and the headquarters are all connected with e-office. So there's no physical file movement right now in many, most of the offices. But right down at the bottom of the pyramid, as it were, in the panchayat, etc., still physical files are there. So we'd like to avoid physical file movement. And uh, the chief secretary has been holding meetings every morning. Monday at 10 a.m. and goes on and on. And he's insisting that we continue this process till we complete by August 15. So well, this will be our second independence in a sense from these physical files. The physical files are not bad. The problem with the physical files is that it takes time. You know, what can be done in two minutes, you take 20 days, 30 days, etc. So that's one. Second is providing services to citizens. So physical file movement is one. So as fast as file can move, those services can be given faster. So while uh, we uh, Kerala is one of the states which we have declared that internet is a basic right. So that's the uh, tagline of KFON itself, Kerala Fiber Optic Network, internet as a basic right. So that being the case, I think every home is going to get connected. Right now, la, uh, the, in, the, the telephone connectivity, the mobile phone connectivity penetration in Kerala is around something like 90, 98 percentage. So we expect to reach out to all homes through fiber and ensure that you know the students who are missing classes, et cetera, because they don't have internet ho at home, et cetera, to provide that. So this is one. Second is, as uh, Varun said, data is a huge thing. So one of the things that I have presented the Honorable Chief Minister here is to have what's called a, a Kerala, uh, a smart Kerala mission, which is that, you know, everybody is buying smart devices. Uh, so they are all buying it from different vendors, different, uh, uh, et cetera. What's the idea? The sensor is not the idea. The idea is to have data, isn't it? And in a very cleansed form, and an acceptable form, which will form uh, become a decision support system. So what we propose to government is that a case idea, which I'm heading right now, will be the repository or will be the organization which will put edge devices, edge routers spread across the board, and we'll be able to give those cleansed data to government as a decision support system. So in a way, you know, data is going to determine decisions. Right now, these are all, you know, many of the decisions are basically emotional or conjectural or based on rhetoric. We don't want that. Government wants to go by data. So we are moving towards a system where artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, drones. For example, I, I just started heading uh, as CMD of Information Kerala Mission. You know, Information Kerala Mission was started in 1999 when the revolution of power started uh, in Kerala. The Kerala People's Planet is called 1999. They built a large number of applications, massive applications. It's unbelievable that this small organization could have created. But right now we are trying to integrate in such a way that, you know, even for a building license, we can use drones and, you know, even without a Google map, the drones can reach up to four centimeter, you know, um, the, this, uh, the, the uh, perfectness so that we can actually use the drone data superimposed on our uh, layers of uh, you know, GIS maps, et cetera, to determine whether the building routes, building uh, permit can be given. People can also access it from home on their mobile phone. So we are reaching a state in uh, the government of India. And today morning also the Honorable Minister, uh, Mr. Rajiv Chandrasekhar addressed all of us on a cloud policy. So India all in all is becoming very, a very tech savvy uh, place to be in. And uh, Kerala is one of the places where right now a lot of technology is happening. All the organs, organizations or government are participating in this. It's not just IT department. IT department, of course, is driving this change. But I can see here that everybody is tech savvy. Everybody is using technology. And today, um, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the word that, the last word that government, citizens should have is, where is government? We don't see government. You know, much like in London, you know, you go to 10 Downing Street, you'll find one policeman there. But every uh, Londoner, an average Londoner is photographed 55 times a day. So uh, times a day, which means passive surveillance is happening. So pervasive use of technology, data centers, uh, fiber optic cable, and all these are changing our lives in a big way. And I believe that all this is going to make ease of living as the as the as the aspiration that governments want to reach and citizens want to reach thank you
Thank you, uh, Dr. Santosh Babu. I think a uh, couple of points highlighted by you are really very important. One is the uh, uh, internet should be a right of uh, every citizen. And uh, second is uh, while we are using data, uh, we should use uh, data in a uh, very intelligent manner so that uh, energy, time, and money of the government could be saved. I'll take this question to uh, Mr. Arvind Kumar, DGSTPI. Sir, uh, while India is gearing up uh, towards becoming a trillion dollar digital economy, uh, how can India become uh, self reliant, Atmanirbhar, in emerging technologies and new age devices? And I would also request you to please throw light on the way forward to digitally empower India to make it more resilient, competitive, and future ready. So there are three C's. First is connectivity, then you content, and third is collection of data. There are three things, and which is happening like anything. You have uh, 642 tr crore transactions per month through UPI, right? 1.3 billion Aadhaar enrollment. So such kind of the huge data you are creating. And connectivity, when it comes to connectivity, we have wireless connectivity generally. I mean, that is not good. So first, and though whatever we say that everybody is connected, everybody has uh, 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 technology enabled, but still there is a we are very poor when it comes to wireline technology or connectivity through optical fiber, which actually really gives you good bandwidth for uh, for doing class, for uh, uh, telemedicine. So you require actually the bandwidth. So there is still a uh, urban and rural divide when it comes to connectivity. So as far as the connectivity is concerned, uh, government should focus further on Bharatnet, though Bharatnet is doing its job. But I think there is a still requirement to reach each and every home of this country through optical fiber. This should be the first. So this, this, this will handle the, our uh, connective, whatever, whether it is through cable operator, whether it is through existing telecom service provider, or we have to do something else. But we must ensure that every each and every house is connected to optical fiber in this country if we really want digital inclusion and we want to give all services through digital media. That should be our first and foremost priority. Then it comes to content. Government has done a lot, but I think there is a lot has to be done. There are a number of government services which is still not available on digital. They all services has to be made available of any state, irrespective of there should be a there should be a rule that all government services is available digitally. So then therefore you will have a lot of content. This is one thing. There should not be any that uh, there should not be any dearth of supply of the content. I mean, all data is available there so that people also have the business case to reach optical fiber at each and every home. So but if there is a there is a demand, then telecom service provider would like to go there. So you have to create demand, which means all services are available digitally. And therefore, there will be a lot of demand and therefore the telecom service will supply the optical fiber there. So it's connectivity, content, and then comes to collection of the data. Collection of data, which means today what we are talking about the data centers. So we should have a clear cut policy, which we are working on. I mean, today minister said that very soon you will have uh, a national uh, data, data center uh, policy. And then when these three are there, now it comes to what are the challenges? So now when you have a 641 uh, transaction per day, then similar exposure, which means there is a there could be more cyber threat, there is a more digital frauds, right? When a lot of transactions happening on internet, then definitely you have more, you have to be more alert. So we have to create then a national cyber policy also in this country, wherein each and every transactions can be secure. You can go, we have the confidence. Every citizen has the confidence that yes, what transaction I am made, making, this transaction is cyber. I say, uh, uh, what we can, it, it, it does not have any uh, chance of fraud, cyber fraud or digital fraud. So we have to work in that space. And this can also be again fulfilled by the new technologies, which could be artificial intelligence. I think blockchain technology can help a lot when it comes to digital fraud, because all transactions are recorded. There are a number of good features in the blockchain technology, which can reduce these all. And therefore, whatever, wherever we have reached, we should take stock what we have done and where we are lacking. And that, that stock so for next five years should be whatever we have done, 
how to stop the cyber fraud. So, so then you again need new technology. So te technology to sustain the technology, you need a technology. Which technology is artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, machine learning, whatever it is. So this is the time next five years, we should focus on the technology which can save our technology. And this should be our respect. That's, that's what I wanted to add. Thank you, Arpit Thank you, sir. Uh, very well said, actually. We need uh, technology to back, actually, technology. Because we cannot depend on yesterday's technology for uh, today's things, uh, today's challenges, because uh, it is continuously evolving. And uh, you talked one very interesting thing about uh, connectivity, seamless connectivity and internet for all. I think Odisha government is doing a lot in this segment. So let me go to Mr. Manoj Kumar Patnaik. Sir, what challenges do you see in the next era of digital India and smart governance? And taking it to the last mile, please share the way forward to digitally empower India and to make it more resilient, competitive, and future ready. Also, if you can share your thoughts on how can India become Atmanirbhar in emerging technologies and new age devices. Over to you. So, um, so I feel the, the digital divide is the biggest challenge going forward. Digital divide in terms of digital infra and digital knowledge. Still now, uh, we have uh, internet penetration uh, to the level of uh, 30 per 40 percent to the village level and it is hardly 50 60 percent to the uh, to the urban areas also digital knowledge even in government officials you find poor uh, basic knowledge lacking digital uh, information so that way it is sometimes we face gaps in our properly administering the digital services to the citizens, though it is ready, ready on the platter to be delivered. So that is a challenge uh, that need to be taken care of cyber security and digital fraud. These are coming every day you find in newspaper people are duped. That is one, one good thing about is that people are now accessing more digital uh, information. One good thing is that, but the other one is the, the dupe, the, the, the people dupe people through digital technology, the, to, through hacking and other kind of, uh, and uh, so we should, uh, we should strengthen that uh, cyber security and uh, cyber security and backed by uh, uh, appropriate, uh, uh, appropriate government machinery to deal with the hackers and the criminals, the digital criminals. And also we should not forget about when there is an explosion of digitalization, there will result in electronic waste. We should take care of that also. So going forward, what we should do, we should uh, extend broadband facility to all villages. We should leverage newest technology in healthcare, education, and farming. This will make ease of use by the common citizens. And one thing I, I find that our, our application should be light on the, uh, light on the uh, bandwidth. Because suddenly we cannot increase bandwidth across across uh, the country, so our application should be uh, light on bandwidth so that it flows till the village level and people can easily uh, access it. And deep inclusion of digital knowledge that is a primary requirement going forward. And you asked about Atma Nirbhar, the, the 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 speed and the with uh, the speed we are going with ease of doing business. In the nationally, and with the the very use, very friendly policies of uh, 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 final, uh, friendly policy regarding uh, support, definitely uh, we will be atmanirbhar in digital technology. My next question to uh, Mr. Prashant Kumar Mittal, sir: What challenges do you see in the next era of digital India and smart governance, and taking it to the last mile, as Dr. Santosh Babu talked about? Please share the way forward to digitally empower India to make it more resilient, competitive, and future ready. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Arpit. Uh, what I see as on date, the biggest challenge is to getting the matching requirement of compute and storage delivered to my data centers. Uh, there has been delay of additional three to six months. So we are uh, facing hard time in getting the things uh, done uh, as per our promises made to custom, uh, uh, that our consumers and customers. And the other thing which I see is uh, that 
with the advent of and percolation of too many things uh, which we are doing on um, cloud platform or the digital transformation there are ample chances chance that my citizen is not having that much information education or comfort level in fighting or reporting the misdoings by uh, miscreants uh, in the name of digital services so yesterday i was reading one news which said that one person has called to some lady that i will evacuate uh, i will help uh, to evacuate your daughter you please deposit that much sum to my account and it was deposited and nothing happened so i think we have to have robust uh, judicial counter system where any person can report the issue 24 by 7 the matching administrative judicial or um, you can say enforcement service digital service should also be provided by government agencies so there has there could be a complete 100% faith in my citizens um, that yeah i will be feel safe if i will use this sir that's all thank you thank you mr mittal and uh, i'll quickly go to dr akhilesh gupta to know uh, how can india become atmanirbhar in technologies new age devices and research and innovation since dst is laying a lot of emphasis on innovation grassroots level innovation and startups over to you you know i think india is moving on a very very i would say progressive path uh and uh, you know in order to achieve the digital economy a trillion digital economy i think disruptive technologies are going to play a very important role and they will become biggest enabler you know very interesting coincidence happened in last two years when covid had started in april march april 2020 around that time uh, you know india has already started or launched a national mission on uh, cyber physical uh, uh, in, you know system and so the entire world not just india entire world had uh, started you know kind of progressing on the disruptive technology area and so india to catch up Uh, has pitched in and launched this mission of 3,660 crores. Uh, you know, uh, a very huge gadget. Uh, you know, mission. Now, when COVID came, and then when it was almost getting uh, entire society was getting affected, the prime minister. Call, uh, gave a clarion call for Atmanirbhar Bharat. Now, you know there is a people believe that you know the Atmanirbhar Bharat means you are going for everything indigenous and which creates conflict with the when you are going for disruptive technology where you need uh, so much of international collaboration. This uh, and kind of going forward with several. development of technology now uh, how, how to create a balance for between uh, these three things so uh, uh, the another coincidence took place around the same time government decided to formulate a national S science and technology innovation policy and i had the privilege of leading that formulation process and this gave us the opportunity that you know let's have a grand vision that how do we create uh, you know a, a kind of balance among the three challenges and how do we take india uh, position into this so this has so basically while the atmanirbhar bharat has focus on indigenous technology development and technology indigenization 
through various intervention, you know, the disruptive technology connect with these indigenous efforts uh, could be very rewarding for India. And this is how the entire vision was created that how disruptive technology can help addressing the art Nirvah Bharat uh, call uh, from Prime Minister and create the intervention. Now, okay. several things happened around this time, and we also brought some kind of uh, you know, clarity on this thing. So, basically, COVID in many ways became a motivator for bringing such intervention. And even if you know, COVID goes, you know, the application of digital technology and the uh, the the uh, growth path of the uh, the disruptive technology will continue to take place. So uh, this is a gain for India, and the kind of uh, development that already taking place at 25 Innovation Hub of DST, I think is is actually going to write a new story in the area of disruptive technology for the country. I would just add one more thing since this is a discussion is going on. See, the did in, in the context of science and technology innovation, we too are grappling with the issue of data sharing. And so as a part of the policy, we have now a vision given that, you know, data sharing, data access, data accuracy, interoperability, and data security, uh, which was mentioned just now. Um, and the availability of all STI data, especially innovation data is not combined with the SNT as on there. All entire the ecosystem data should be available as one stock shop, not seen at different uh, uh, you know, portals. So this is being kind of being addressed through this policy. And uh, an STI observatory is recommended there. It become a one stock shop for all access and sharing of issue. And also, we, have, we already have a data sharing policy being uh, run uh, or, uh, in fact, it was developed, uh, it was formulated by DST. Uh, uh, that also be, become very uh, important in the entire uh, data issue because unless data is shared, you know, uh, data is, uh, is uh, we consider data is the power. But power is only when you share the data. And therefore, it's very important that in the context of SCI, data is not only generated, not only uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's maintained uh, at one portal, but also it should be shared with it. Let me go to Mr. Das. Mr. Das, banking and technology are playing a significant role in governance and G2C and G2B services. What is the way forward for digital in India, according to you? And what are the top three immediate priorities for Access Bank in India? The government has focused very aggressively on digitizing the economy. We start with Jandan scheme, Aadhaar, mobile banking, then try Trinity of what we call a jam services currently now. So if you look at the Smart City Initiative, the 117 aspirational district initiative, the PM Kisan uh, Yojana, if you look at the news, uh, if, and if, if you also look at uh, the Minister of Finance Circular, which opens up private banking now for all government-related projects uh, across the country to be the primary accredited banker. There is, there, there is single nodal account, there is public uh, fund management system, PFMS is becoming the standard in terms of uh, doing uh, business in terms of government disbursement. Bharat Net is coming up very strongly. CSCs are been put up across everywhere. So there's a whole load of things which government is doing in terms of setting up the platform. And from our side, we are focused in uh, at access. We're focused in each and every one of them. We have the right platform. We work with the right technology. We connect with the right people, and then we are we are and and the leverage of the branch network that we have across the country been present in almost every city, look and corner and expanding, gives us those added impetus. But even if you look at G2B, for example, if you look at, uh, say, for example, uh, the government e-market initiative program, I think that's a tremendous initiative which government is doing. I mean, the way the state governments are now putting on each of the things of the GEM portal, 
I think is you know it it, it is completely it is almost close to about 12, 12 crore people now. Technology has enabled uh, the rendering of these multiple licenses obsolete. So, uh, in one side you have all various platforms which are getting set up, which are the various initiatives which are get, getting set up through so both the central sponsor scheme, the central sector scheme, the state schemes, the CM schemes, and everything for the money to be pushed to the last beneficiary. And where does the bank come in, come to play? And we, from our side, we are working very closely with the treasury. We have the right solution. Solution encompasses not only the main PFMS platform. It, it comes with both the, on the various APIs, which we can dovetail into that PFMS platform. And overall, it's a happy place for all of us to be in currently now, as the government is pushing itself towards a trillion dollar economy. And from our side, the bank is completely aligned to the government's vision of digital India. Thank you, Mr. Das. And uh, now I'll again uh, go to Mr. Varun Gupta. Uh, sir, in a data-driven culture, what is next for transformation between human intelligence and the artificial intelligence? We talked a lot about AI. Uh, how to make a, a more resilient, competitive, and future-ready digital ecosystem? Yes, I, I, I say, you know, a lot of uh, buzz around AI and uh, machine learning is there, but uh, uh, I represent the uh, industry uh, which uh, works in that uh, uh, domain largely and uses data to make AI ML models and predictive other cases. But one thing I want to say, one thing you mentioned is human intelligence. And uh, while artificial intelligence is something which gives uh, people an impression about some sci-fi movie where, you know, uh, AI can replace human intelligence. But at uh, in our industry, we believe that it's actually to assist human intelligence. Machine needs to serve as a uh, serve humans, not the other way around. And this is the reason we like to call it uh, other words. We use AI for augmented uh, intelligence to augment the human intelligence. Having said that, uh, in uh, in order to make a resilient and uh, competitive and uh, let's say a strong data driven and digital. Uh, let's say framework my uh, my uh, experience uh, has been that it has to be starting from the culture of using technology in many ways possible and openness of uh, different constituent of the framework to adapt uh, and embrace technology and uh, uh, and this generally comes when you have a culture of uh, in the organization or in the uh, let's say whatever if it's a cluster of asking questions and uh, asking questions based on data. Uh, many times people take decisions based on gut feels. So we need to develop a culture where people ask, all right, uh, fair enough, but what is the basis of your decision? Is there a data to back it up? And that is the kind of questions people should be asking. And that generally comes uh, when there's a push from the top. Uh, we have seen in the last uh, few years uh, because of so many uh, COVID being one, but uh, I would want to congratulate uh, leadership across uh, different uh, state governments as well as in uh, central government, uh, cutting across party lines. There's a strong push for technology to be used, and that makes things happen. You know, there's a difference you see that in certain organizations you will see a fast adoption, and in some cases it's not. So cultural change uh, and uh, commitment of the top leadership is the primary one. And uh, if you see which direction this uh, transformation is going to take, I strongly uh, want to echo my uh, uh, thoughts uh, with the rest of the uh, participants that uh, it's going to uh, move towards, of course, assisted uh, intelligence going forward. And data, of course, is the new oil, as they say, and that's going to play a large role to make those models. And uh, uh, more and more organizations are going to choose uh, uh, ways to uh, unearth the gold information in this data. And people uh, currently are talking about descriptive analysis first, descriptive intelligence, wherein uh, people will get to know what's happening or what has happened in the past. And uh, though many of the government organizations and private alike, but more so in government, I would uh, want to say are still to embark on that journey of descriptive analysis. And once this is done, then uh, people are moving to, people will move to, and some of them have already, and I, I guess, but a large part is still to be done AIMLs uh, apart from, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
a little bit here and there has not been embraced to its full potential so people will uh, the technology can answer the questions of now uh, predictive uh, intelligence this is what it can happen so one uh, one question that uh, people can ask in case of a governance and uh, governance uh, policy implementation tracking that policy and making sure that it comes back on track and take effective actions to ensure that is one of the large i would say primary job of a government is government bodies are and uh, the predictive uh, intelligence can help them to say you know in case something is delayed how long it will take to complete that project for example jal, jal jeevan mission we were working with them so we could develop some models for them to say in case the certain state or uh, uh, let's say geography is lacking in its target to do that har ghar jal uh, target tap water for each heart solid connection how much our time is going to take and the third uh, part which is going to be of course uh, the as of now known to humans is uh, uh, prescriptive uh, intelligence wherein the technology can also help you help humans to uh, say what do you need to do to achieve that what is lacking so in case you have to complete this target by uh, 2022 september and current uh, uh, at the current pace it's not going to get completed by let's say 6 months uh, from that time what do you need to do what kind of resource augmentation you need to do what do you need to plug in more money and things like that and this is where i believe uh, machines uh, are going to assist humans to take better decisions uh it is going to improve uh, more accountability ai ml the reason that it's not adopted is because government is very uh, uh let's say uh, uh i would say sensitive that whatever prescription and predictive it gives should be 100% accurate and uh, uh, uh wishful it may sound but it is, it's not going to be happening machines are never going to be 100% accurate they can give certain uh, confidence interval with which we can predict the future future by definition is unpredictable but we try to uh, look at the past to predict it and this is where machines are going to help us and uh, and that's the future i believe where humans will take uh, uh, inputs from machines and algorithms to take better decisions rather than gut feeling Thank you, Mr. Varun. Uh, the nation is changing rapidly and uh, promoting digital inclusion and empowerment. With India aiming to develop itself as a one trillion dollar digital economy by 2025, it is needed that we develop an equitable and effective future-ready digital ecosystem by continuous skilling development, increased access, and affordability of digital technology. With this, I conclude today's panel discussion: Reimagine Government Technology in 2022, part of third edition of National Governance Virtual Summit. On behalf of ET government I sincerely thank our guest panelists thank you so much for joining Thank you so much everyone for such a detailed discussion thank you very much indeed your perspectives gave us some very valid points to ponder over well now ladies and gentlemen we'll take a short break stay tuned and you can also utilize this time to explore the expo area and a visit to the networking lounge